Hi, everyone. Well, this is coming. Vancouver International Film Festival, my favorite time of year. So many provocative, innovative, and important films. I think there's like 110 feature films, 75 shorts, so many talks. It's all happening both online and in person coming up in October. And, you know, I'm glad about the in person because I've missed that, um, especially talking to people in lineups. I love the sense of community that's created where you go, well, what did you love? And someone else goes, you know, here's what I loved. And then you, so you change your plan for the day if you're doing a binge, because I like, I'm a binger. Um, anyway, tickets, you can also get and take a look at all the information, the program, everything else, viv.org online. Um, I think single tickets are like $10. I know that students can get a pass for 60 household, I think, um, hundred and something. But imagine that if you're a family and you get a household pass and the kids get to decide, everybody picks a movie and you do a full day of my movie, my movie, my movie, or however many you actually it could be a bunch of friends maybe too. Um, what an incredible way to spend the weekend. So today we're diving in, we're talking to um, filmmakers, director Gloria Pancrazi and Alana Jean. Um, there are two passionate filmmakers who are connected with activists, indigenous leaders and renowned scientists to understand the fate of the orcas and find solutions to some of our more pressing environmental threats. Their film that's going to premiere at the festival, Co-Extinction, uh, Gloria is a Canadian documentary filmmaker. She's worked on environmental and indigenous justice documentaries, including The Country and Impossible to Contain. And after witnessing the impending extinction of the South the southern resident orcas, she decided to take matters into her own hands and create Co-Extinction, the documentary that we're talking about in hopes that it would educate and inspire people to take action. Elena Jean is also a Canadian documentary filmmaker. She's based out of Tofino and she's filmed endangered species around the world with world-renowned organizations like Seal Legacy and Milky Wire. Her passion to tell stories about hope, integrity and wild beauty and to show the in interconnected patterns of extinction. They're both committed to save the last, I think it's 74 still, Southern resident orcas from extinction. So welcome to the show, you two. Thank, thank you so much. Us. Yeah, thank you for having us. Um, yeah. As I was telling you guys, I loved this film. I've seen so many films that try to be a call to action, but I'm telling you, yours literally got right into the heart. It covers so many areas, uh, so many issues that are interconnected, but there's such, I guess it's the emotional opening, you know, sharing the story that kind of, I hope, woke the world up a little bit when we had that orca, the J35 carrying her um, deceased baby calf for 17 days on the surface of the ocean. I mean, it was heartbreaking at the time and important, I think, not to forget because we've got to dive into what's going on. And you guys definitely know about that. So did that event um, personally propel you to make this film? Was the film already in motion at that point? Just maybe give us a sense of, you know, we know it's a code red, you know, the United Nations said so, the climate change report. What, but what was the moment for you to where you just went, okay, I have to do something. Yeah. I mean, for when J35 started to carry her baby, we were just starting to film. So we the, the film was already almost, not a year, but like a good nine months in the making. We had done all the pre-production, raised funds to go filming. And then, you know, I don't know if that happened to you, Elle, but like all my friends and family members started to send me the story. And obviously, like, you know, when you're in the story, you know, as soon as it happens that, you know, that J35 had lost her calf. But so we were already in the thick of it when that happened. Um, and it was a heartbreaking story to, to follow. And every day, just get that extra. She's carrying it for another day. She's carrying it for another day. And, you know, yeah, it was definitely a very heavily felt in the community to, to watch that, that mother orca just show her grief. Um, and it definitely had an impact on us. But personally, when it started, I was like, I have to do something about this. Um, I was volunteering for different organizations and I was writing this annual report for Living Oceans. And so 
I pretty much had like all the bad, like all the really heart wrenching information about the Southern resident orcas in front of me, like all the issues they're facing, all the deaths, everything. And it was just like, bam, they're facing extinction. Um, and then going to monitor them on the ground is where I got to like see that on the ground and the mix of the two and my personal like love for orcas ever since I was a kid that was the code red on my end of just being like we got to make sure that they that they're fought for and that and they've already been fought for by many many people but just that they that they can survive and Elena for you yeah that moment uh, I you know I think I don't know that it was a specific moment or turning point um, that it was like, ah, yes, must make this film. This is, you know, my calling. Um, I'm Gloria has always really, really known and loved these orcas. And I think that, you know, really stands strong for her. For me, I've got this general interest and have always had in, in wildlife and the extinction crisis, but seeing her passion for the orcas really was something that, um, you know, it was so, honest and pure and but fiery also and that is something that really motivated and stood out to me you know also about her character you know she was she's uh when she came to me um with this idea for the film you know she was very much on a mission um and I think that really motivated me but also you know at the time I was filming starting kind of to film endangered species around the world and take after engineering school, taking a renewed interest in conservation work through this organization that I had been building. And so it was getting on the ground and seeing endangered species and um, the stories in real life. And, you know, every species has a story that is so connected to their greater environment and what's happening there. And so when I was on the West coast of Canada um, and I'd met Gloria and I was filming um, the organization that she was working for uh, tracking the orcas and taking data on them and seeing, you know, this happening in my own home country and that kind of much bigger picture story, I think um, was another massive motivating factor for me that this was a big story happening here at home. And I think, Canada and, you know, the Pacific Northwest, you know, the States too, there's this perception that it's this beautiful, pristine, you know, frontier of wildlife and um, wildness, when in reality, just like so many places around the world, there's some massive um, issues and that, that are happening here that need to be addressed that are causing, you know, I think one of the one of the big things we found out in the film as to why the orcas were going extinct and so many different reasons, but, um, you know, just seeing those issues firsthand here in this Western country in this perfect place, you know, um, really opened my eyes and it's a story that needs to be told and people need to know. And so we're going to dive into all those issues because I think some of them people aren't really aware of completely. I know people understand whales are suffering in captivity. I think everybody understands that, but I don't think they understand that they're suffering in the wild. So let's dive in. I mean, there's 74 Southern resident killer whales left. And I, I heard, has it changed already? Today. <laughs> oh. Um, awkward, hurtful laugh. Sorry. Um, yeah. L47 Marina, who is a matriarch or was a matriarch and a grandmother, um, has been declared missing and possibly most likely deceased by the Center for Well Research. Once they've seen the pod without the member for three times, that's when they declare the whale missing and most likely deceased. So yeah, we got that news today, which, um, is a tough one. Matriarchs and grandmothers are very, very, very important for the population. So it's, um, it's scary. It hurts the heart, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, three are pregnant right now. Is that that's correct? And mm -hmm. as we know, or at least in your movie, I know you talk about so many, the difficulty around pregnancy due to stress and um, food shortages and all sorts of things that we're going to dive into. But I'm just wondering, because I also heard there was a new Canadian guideline um, for boats to stay away. Is that true? Is that in effect by 400 meters? Is that true? And is that enough? Is that even helpful to these three um, pregnancies right now? Yeah, I mean, isn't it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's a kilometer for the southern resident killer whales. 
Is it? Um, I saw 400 meters, but I could, that was just, that was the news. <laughs> it's definitely helpful. I mean, the, since working on the film, new um, guidelines were enacted and um, it's definitely helpful. I know the Southern resident killer whales have had a lot less um, boat traffic surrounding them resultantly, but the funny side of the equation is it's also more difficult to um, stay aware of how they're doing. Right. Um, though uh, Center for Well Research and whatnot has permits. Right. So, and, and what is the problem with both noise and proximity? Maybe we could break that down for listeners. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's also, it's a very multi-layered issue. And just before getting into it, mm. I would say there's good things and bad things with the guide, not with the guidelines necessarily, but with um, the government's approach to the guidelines is more what I would say. Um, so orcas echolocate the fine food. They use sound and this click sound to locate where each other are, food is, that's how they see. So when there are noise there, that prevents that from happening. Um, and when you have orcas that are starving and that are really struggling, that makes it a lot more difficult for them. It also, there's a new study that came out showing that it can add stress, can make it harder for them to reproduce. So it's definitely an issue and it's a part I always like to look at this as like a big puzzle and it's a part of the puzzle but a big issue we're seeing for example you know a few weeks ago the two-year-old um, baby female calf was shown with her body mass declining and so Seattle Times has this article that comes out with the headline uh, you know government says for boats orders for boats to stay away to give them space good Yes, when whales are starving and they're stressed, they need space. But what if that headline was something like governor, like the government orders for the breach of the four lower Snake River dams, you know? And I think what happens is just, yes, noise disturbance is an issue, but it's always, always, always used as the, as the scapegoat. And if you remove all the boats in the Sailor Sea, mm -hmm. um, these whales still won't be finding enough food. Got so it. it's... It's a tricky thing and it's um, there's a lot of controversy on it. I'd also say on the Canadian government side of things, I always find it very ironic that they are, you know, putting these guidelines that are needed, but then also pushing forward a pipeline that will increase tanker traffic sevenfold. Right. There's like right. a, you know, where that noise disturbance is so much worse than what boats will do. So so since you've mentioned those two, I definitely want to cover those two before we move on to uh, salmon and fish farms and everything else. So the dams, you're talking about the Snake River system, maybe tell everyone a bit about how that is preventing, because it's preventing the salmon from doing their, it's con like, in other words, everything here is interconnected. That's the amazing thing of your film to see it in one place and go, oh my God, it's not just one thing. As you say, stop the boats, tone down the noise. They're still going to be hungry. So if you can comment on the dam situation, let's start there. And then we can look at the, maybe the pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. The Snake River dams were, are, um, a really, really significant issue that we look at. And they are significant because what Gloria, you know, said is that the one of the major concerns, if not the, the most major concern for the Southern resident killer whales, the most um, urgent one is that they're not finding enough. They're not finding enough food to eat. So they're foraging and they're looking, they're not getting enough salmon, um, hence why they're starving. Um, so that was a big thing that we looked into and, uh, salmon are, as a species, you know, live this kind of lifestyle, life cycle where they're born in the river systems, and then they come down and they live in the ocean out, you know, for four years, or depending on the species, they'll live in the ocean, and then they migrate back to the, orig the original river system where they were born to come back and spawn to reproduce. Um, so they have this life cycle. And so, you know, the river systems, as much as the ocean ecosystem, are really important for salmon survival, right? So um, the habitat of the river systems is, and the health of their habitat, the river systems is really important. But of course, you know, a lot of people live um, in the Pacific Northwest. And um, so habitat destruction is a real issue for salmon. And there are 
four very large dams that were built um, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, in the, I believe it was starting in the 1950s or it was the 1960s, these dams were built in the post-war era um, when there was kind of this mindset of man conquer nature. You know, we were really coming to in terms of our engineering capabilities and our science, you know, the prowess of our, mm -hmm. of our scientific discoveries and whatnot and starting to really transform the landscapes around us. And um, so these dams came about around that, around that time as well. And these dams totally transformed the river systems. And this is something that I think a lot of people don't realize is how transformative um, dams, large dams especially can be for, well, dams in general for, um, for river systems. We have this perception, generally speaking, the public has this perception that dams are this eco-friendly or sustainable source of power, right? Um, but, you, but you miss entirely how dramatically they transform the landscape and the ecosystem. So these rivers, turn into essentially leak, lukewarm lakes. <laughs> Basically the river widens. Um, and so, you know, if you look at photos of, or, you know, if you can find footage of what the Snake River system, which is, which attaches to the Columbia River system. So it's this massive and very important river system, especially for salmon populations historically um, in the Pacific Northwest down through Washington um, and beyond. Um, uh, if you look at footage and photos of what it looked like beforehand, you can see just how dramatically the landscape changed and the foliage disappeared and the orchards, orchards and everything. And it became dry and barren. And not only that, but the indigenous populations that lived on, along the river could no longer fish for salmon, right? So that's kind of part of this interconnected piece as well. But so if we were to remove those dams, um, which so much research has been done to prove that it would be the most effective way at bringing back salmon populations. Um, and it's estimated that 8 million salmon um, could eventually come to return and salmon are very resilient. So there would be a fallout initially for a few years when the river would start to rewild and then salmon would start to return up the river. And so that's a massive amount of salmon potentially returning to the ocean. Have dams been deserts. breached before? And were those the results? Is that what we've seen? Yeah, yeah, Gloria, if you want to speak on that. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, yeah, we've seen this with uh, different dams. A big example of that is the Elwha removal, where um, you know it exceeded expectation, like the salmon returning. And there have been, you know, in the latest latest years, we've worked on this documentary smaller dam removal that they're taking on. So. Again, I think it speaks to the government knowing what they have to do, but not being willing to take the big, bold actions, right? Like right. they're like, okay, we'll take out these small dams. Meanwhile, there's these four huge dams that don't make sense economically, you know, hydropower speaking, all of that electricity, and it's just, they're not willing to remove them. So, and so, so this is the States where, you know, they're saying, no, we're not going to do that to help endangered salmon. Is there, how do we advocate for that being here in Canada? What can we do? Around I, I would say advocate for both. I think even as Canadians, a global, you know, people worldwide looking at the states being like, you're not doing your due diligence environmentally and socially speaking is huge. That puts pressure on the government. So definitely still, you know, call the senators, write to the senators when there are actions there, which we're sharing when they do happen, like join however you can. Mm -hmm. But there are, you know, also if you are local to, to so-called British Columbia, there's a lot of habitat restoration projects happening. Uh, there's the very controversial site seat dam being built. Um, you know, so there's a lot you can do locally as well. Um, Where's that dam being built? Uh, in On Peace River, mm -hmm. which um, we don't know as much about that one as the Snake River dams because we didn't do a film on it. <laughs> the amount of research yeah, that yeah, went into yeah. making this film. Um, so we know a lot about those issues, not so much about site seat dam enough to know that it's similar in the sense of not making sense, you know, economically speaking or electricity speaking, um, and that it would also destroy the environment there. So um, I, I would urge everyone listening to go check out, learn more about the site C Dam. Um, I know there's a really great podcast with Luke Wallace. Um, as for watershed, like river restoration projects, I would look at Watershed Watch. Um, and once our take action page is live, there will be more um, 
organizations you can follow to, to help support them. So awesome. we'll check that out as well. And so you also mentioned the pipeline, which, um, you know, it's a, it's definitely an issue. I mean, today's election day, you know, um, I guess people, it's a really weird kind of, first of all, I think I want to say that hopefully everyone's aware that it is on unceded indigenous land, which if you don't know what that means, it means that no treaty was signed, that the federal government actually has no right to be there. And it's moving ahead. It's moving along, it seems. So um, I know you mentioned in the film, and I hope you're okay with me, saying this stat because it was staggering to me in terms of tankers and noise that that pipeline would increase tankers by 700%. I mean, that's, they're noisy as it is. They're affecting um, the pods as it is, but to think 700 times more because there'd be more tankers. Um, What else do you want to say about the pipeline that can help wake people up a little bit to this isn't just an economical decision, you know, like this is good for Canada. It's not good for Canada. If it's not good for the indigenous, if it's not good for our animals, if it's not good, how can it be good for Canada? Anyway, I hand it over to you. Where would you go with that whole big issue? Um, Oh my goodness. (laughs) The pipeline is concerning in so many ways. I mean, it's, you know, from an economic standpoint, we're just seeing that it's costing significantly more than it will in terms of its returns. You know, there's been a recent estimate that came out of one of Canada's universities, I think it might have been Dalhousie or something, that took a look at, uh, did an economic analysis not that long ago that saw that it would be losing 11.4 or, you know, just over $10 billion dollars um, in its lifetime, um, for Canada. So, and not only that, but, you know, we are in, I think really waking up to the severity of the climate crisis and there is no community. There are no people that are immune to the effects of the climate crisis now, no ecosystem, but really people, you know, we saw with the fires this year, Mm -hmm. you know, through just raging across the Pacific Northwest and continuing to, and and that's just going to continue. And so I think people are waking up to the urgency of the climate crisis. And, you know, the fact that we, the the Canadian government bought a pipeline and made promises, you know, with the Paris um, Accord to, you know, climate agreement that it's just, it's completely backwards. So I think, you know, you mentioned that that banner in the film that one of our main characters kind of likes to hang around the city and anytime he's um, anytime he's doing uh, an event or anything, the, you know, the climate leaders don't build pipelines, right? So yeah. uh, Canada needs to be and has pronounced themselves to be a climate leader. You know, we are a first world country that should be leading. We should be leading the fight against the climate crisis, leading the charge. Um, and here we are, you know, building this, this pipeline. Um, that's and subsidizing, increase. right? Yeah, Fossil exactly. fuels across the board. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's insanity. It's just completely backwards. Um, and so, yeah, you know, the fallout effects of having this pipeline here just, you know, are, are massive economically, but, you know, even more massive from, or just, they're also massive from uh, an environmental standpoint for the orcas, but for salmon, you know, salmon, you know, to another issue that we actually don't talk about really that much in the in the film, but is that um, salmon are a temperature sensitive species. And as the water as the ocean temperatures and river temperatures continue to warm, this is a very, very serious issue because salmon populations can't thrive and in fact are, start to be killed by the, the temperature, the surface temperature of the, of the water. So that's a massive concern as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the Aboriginal um, population seems split a little bit on this, or there's some fractures anyway, in terms of the pipeline. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, um, I think, and we and we talk about this in the film. I think it comes back to the colonialism and you know corrupt system with a lot of cracks in its in our system. You know, like I think a lot of indigenous nations have been backed into a corner to, you know, 
they shouldn't have to choose between economic well-being and environmental well-being. And at the root of it is, is 100% colonialism and capitalism. And so I think that's something to look at as well with, you know, the pipeline, but also this entire film is, is systemic issues and, and changing that, you know, like at the root, looking at these bold actions we can take and really like fighting off. Yeah. I'm repeating myself, but systemic issues. Well, and, and which then takes us again to this look inside that we're all being called to do. I mean, there was a, a, another piece in the film where you showed in 1964, the footage of a whale that had been shot and didn't die, but they put it in a pool and people came to watch I mean, I'm looking at that horrified going, what is wrong with people? It, it's like, pe and, and around the world, there are people still seeing animals as entertainment, as somehow, as if somehow it's a commodity for us to um, use. That's connected with what we're talking about. It's connected with the pipeline. It's co connected with colonialization and that attitude of um, some sort of privilege that you can be in that position do you have thoughts about the root of that? Because I mean, it's one thing to react, but it's another to go, wait, um, how does it spill over into my life? How am I perpetuating? And I just mean, you know, any individual listening, how do I perpetuate that kind of, I'm going to answer my own question and then ask for you to do it too. But for me, it's about separation. When people feel separate from a living being, these kinds of problems occur. And we're seeing it even in different protests, even within communities that are supposed to be a community. This fracturing is to me, the root feels like a kind of separation, like we're different somehow, as opposed to a focus on our interconnectivity and our oneness. That's my hit, but I'm really curious to hear what yours is. Yeah, I mean, you're spot on. And I feel like I will have a lot to say. You're like, we're like, yes, agreed. <laughs> um, I definitely think it's, again, at the root of it is, is this system, you know, that teaches that teaches us from the moment we're born that, you know, nature is separate from us. It's a very egocentric yeah. system, you know, me, what serves my purpose right now. And especially right now, if you look at how we live our lives, right? It's like, I want this right now. And I'm not thinking of the future or of others. And I think a big thing that I've been, you know, that throughout the making of this film and in my personal life, I've been thinking a lot about is moving from an egocentric way of thinking of things to an ecocentric way of thinking of, thinking mm -hmm. of things. So instead of, you know, a triangle with white men on top and everything else below it um, in, a, in a triangle, uh, going to a circle where everything is connected, everything has the same importance. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, that reconnects again with listening to indigenous knowledge and indigenous principles and ways of thinking, thinking and leadership. Um, and that is key to addressing and to taking on these big issues we're, we're facing right now. Yeah. Helena? You're muted. Your mic's off, I think. Hey, Hi. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I'm just here. I'm talking to myself. Um, yeah, I think you, you know, that was a great example, you know, with the orca in the aquarium and kind of it's, it's amazing how far I think a more hopeful look is just to see how far we have progressed. You know, if you think about back in the, in the sixties, you know, when the orca was, orcas used to be feared, right? You know, fishermen and whatnot would, would shoot at them. Um, and they used to be feared. And then, you know, one was captured and then, oh my gosh, they're kind of friendly, actually. They're, mm -hmm. they're kind of, you know, uh, and so then there became this fascination with them as this other sentient kind of being as this other intelligence and so you know we have them in these aquariums and for these sea world shows but you know since um blackfish and there's big been a big awakening and we've made a lot of progress there and being like well that's that's wrong to have them here and to be to be using them as a commodity but the, the it's you know it continues in that you know whale watching we continue to commoditize them in that sense but you know with sam and the other big focus of the film you know 
continues to be commoditized as we don't see it as a living, breathing being. And, um, you know, we live in this very fear driven world where we're very concerned for our well being and our success. And I think that, um, you know, this capitalist driven society, you know, everyone and this individualistic driven society, everyone for themselves, um, if I think people, you know, without trying to place too much blame on the individual, because it is a systemic, systemic problem, you know, we just live in this fear driven society that makes us the, you know, so slaves to our <laughs> economic system, um, and this way of being, but, uh, we, we don't have to choose that. And I think increasingly that awareness around, we can't continue to choose it because it equates to our future demise, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's this uh, rising awareness. So, you know, what Gloria said in, you know, indigenous lived here successfully long before we did and, and lived in, in greater harmony with, with the natural world around them. And I think um, it's also a more beautiful and healthy way to live, you know, a less fearful way. To live and that's the gift that i think we can give ourselves also in the process of choosing this perception of greater oneness and connectivity is a gift of greater peace and happiness you know it feels good we are meant to we are built to be connected that's right. in our in our dna and so it's a beautiful thing we get to um, try to work towards and choose now and and to me the words i'd use is i turning i into we which everything you're saying there is we language, right? Uh, yeah. Which, yeah. yeah, I mean, the language is so important these days and how it is it either demonstrates a circle or it doesn't. Yeah. It's so true. And if I can just add one more thing, I love what the two of you are saying so much. And um, I think, you know, having made a film on the orcas, they are at the core a we community you know what I mean like orcas there's this saying I, th I believe it's Ken Balcom who who um said it is that they don't have a home you know they they don't have a cave to go to they don't they swim through the ocean and they are each other's home and they go through any hardship celebration anything together and with a very something with orcas is they have a very strong empathy and emotional intelligence and I think as like to what you were saying, Alana, another part of like, you know, fighting that fear-based system and, and issues and all of that is, is opening up our empathy and our community. Yeah. And there's so much to learn from the orcas on that end. And right. I always think that's a very beautiful. I love that. I love that you brought that, you know, the culture of the orcas is so, I don't think people are that aware. And when I know in the film, um, that one piece where you talked about the teeth marks, uh, uh, someone had given birth and there were teeth marks on the baby because another whale had helped the breach birth and get the baby out. Like, I'm just, wow. So there's relationship going on in a big way. And we need to wake up to that, that everyone's relating and, and we're the ones who are blind. I mean, again, back to the whole systemic um, the whole idea that we somehow are in the know and everything else is not, or, you know, like you say, that pyramid of uh, hierarchy. Um, so thank you for saying that. We've got to move into fish farms now because it's such a big deal also. And, you know, again, I learned so much because as much as I knew that I didn't want to be buying fish from fish farms in the store, I had no idea that 95% of fish farms and supermarkets are infected with a Norwegian virus. And then well, I guess wild salmon are also being exposed to it. And the whole industry is Norwegian, seems to be mostly Norwegian, this kind of dirty farming that's being done on land that isn't, doesn't even belong to them. So what can we tell us more about it and what we can do to support immediate action? Um. Yeah, it's uh, the fish farm issue is an absolutely incredible example of how we have truly commoditized the natural world. And, you know, it's it, I mean, fish farms are not dissimilar whatsoever from these big factory farms that, you know, the veganism movement and, and just in general, I think the public has gained a greater awareness 
of um, in the last decade or so. You know, we've got these fish piled together within this open net pen that is leaking all of these toxins and viruses into the environment. It's it's arguably even more frightening than um, from a strictly ecological perspective or environmental uh, pollutants perspective than some of these factory farms on land because, you know, water is directly transfers things so much easier, right? And we have so, you know, it's one of those classic examples of out of sight, out of mind issues as well, too, because these farms are out in, you know, the Broughton Archipelago or all around, you know, uh, Vancouver Island and in the Salish Sea and out on the water kind of away from um, the eyes of the, of the public, um, but within traditional territory of First Nations, of course, because that's okay, apparently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it's a it's a great issue of um, great example of how, you know, industry has come in uh, large these, you know, the Norwegian industry specifically, um, you know, had deals created these deals and, and um, um, retrieve permits from the Canadian government um, to go in and without the permission of um, most of these First Nations communities. Um, many of them um, they don't have permission from and they were just they just built these large factory type farms um, and we have seen now um, some there I mean the the research you know we we tell Al Alexandra Morton's cover her story a bit in the film and and her, her the work that she's done has just made it unbelievably evident that um, the fish farms are affecting wild salmon populations negatively not just through the virus but also through um, you know, sea lice is another really big issue. And it's amazing because the writing was on the wall even before these fish farms came in, you know, uh, in other places around the world, Norway, we've seen the collapse of wild salmon populations after the arrival and, and continuation of these fish farms. So in, in Scotland and Norway and, and other countries. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, by, by far now extremely evident that they're contributing to wild salmon declines. And, and thankfully, I think people are starting to pay more attention to this, this issue. And we have seen um, the removal of um, and the decided removal from by the government uh, and the public to have these farms removed in, in BC. So that's in the coming years, we're going to see a lot of these farms taken out, which is really good. And there's been, there's, we've seen in the Discovery Islands, actually, the removal of the farms has immediately made an impact on the wild salmon populations with sea lice. So um, baby salmon were, are showing up with way less sea lice than there was before. And that's a huge, huge win. It still seems really slow. Like I, I, the thing I read was 17 fish farms to be removed by 2023. And then uh, 2022 companies would need First Nations consent to farm fish in Indigenous territory. But there's still 109 fish farms supposedly left. Like, yeah. is that right? Is that does that match the your knowledge? Yeah. And I. Yeah, that that does match it. Um, I think it's definitely, you know, the bureaucracy of it makes it slow. Yeah. Um, and I think also something to be mindful, for example, in the Broaden Archipelago, some are already being decommissioned, but I believe it is seven fish farms. Um, could still, there could still be a loophole that the companies find a way to keep them in there. So there could still, they're fighting to get them decommissioned there. Um, and it's, you know, tug and pull and, I believe they're on their way out. And when I, you know, like, I believe they're on their way out, but we have to keep showing up and keep saying we don't want these there. So a great campaign that was um, led by Alexander Morton, Tavish Campbell, um, and many other really amazing conservationists was to thank uh, the, the Minister of Fisheries uh, for removing for deciding to stand with indigenous nations and remove the fish farms in discovery islands and so that to be like first of all alex told me this she's like just the fact that like we're thinking so a government official is they're not something they're really used to um <laughs> so that's really good and then showing them that yes this is what we want like keep doing that mm -hmm. so yeah, they're on their way out there's still plenty and I, I believe especially on the west coast of the island is where they're the least uh you know big movements happening to remove them uh, if i'm not mistaken and um and i think it's just uh, to answer your question of like 
both it going really slowly or, you know, what can we do yes. is um, standing with the indigenous nations when they're, you know, saying we don't want these fish farms in our territories, like, you know, what we saw in the Broad Archipelago, what we saw in Discovery Islands, this is key. Um, and also, you know, don't buy farmed salmon, um, you know, show face there too. And what I will say is also, there's a lot of mislabeled wild salmon, uh, mis sorry, yeah, farmed salmon labeled as wild salmon in the grocery stores. So um, how can they do that? I believe it's marketing. Just, yeah. <laughs> it's, so there's yeah. no law that says you can't. I mean, that's well, false. It'll say local. It will say local. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Or it will say uh, Atlantic yeah, local salmon. Pacific. If you don't know yeah. that, you know, right. you could think it's coming from the Atlantic, but it's actually like. So, what's um, the best way? You're at the grocery store. I want to be able to do this. And I for sure would be looking at that going, ah, you know, local. Like, I don't know. What, what do you think? Do you think you need to ask? Do you think you actually need to say to the stores? Asking Would it be a conversation a with idea. Safeway? Like, I think that's a great idea telling your store, hey, I want to make sure this is uh, where I'm getting my fish from. I would say personally what I'm doing because mm -hmm. I, it's, it's a very tricky issue. And um, you also got to keep in mind, you know, local fishermen that have been here forever and whose job depends on it. You have to think of like mm. indigenous fishermen whose this is their job as well. Um, but personally, I, I would only get it if it like, if I, if I saw the fishermen themselves, you know what I mean? Like, and personally, I don't eat salmon, but this is, this is what I would do. I, I personally would be very, very mindful of wherever I bought it in the grocery store and wouldn't trust it unless I like, know exactly where it came from myself and saw it with my own eyes and you're creating a link so when once the film premieres you're also going to have a, a call to action kind of a place where people can go is this the kind of thing you're going to take a look at and go hey okay let's write safeway loblaws whatever it all is and say you know no as yeah. a consumer like we do have power as a consumer and as you say we could just stop buying it but on the other hand, when you stop buying salmon, what at all altogether, is there an impact on the local fishermen? And, you know, all it, it, it sort of is complicated, isn't it? It's yeah. very complicated. And I think at the root of it is just transition. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think no matter what, the way we are doing it, the way we are fishing right now is not sustainable. Right. Um, and we've done a lot of research on it. It's a very, very complicated issue that I don't think I could do it justice just talking about it here. Um, but yeah, just, I forgot my train of thought. Well, one thing I wanted to add, if I may, is I was blown away at the staggering amount, the statistic that you said uh, in the film, how much salmon North America eats in a day. Mm. Um, I don't have it right in front of me here, but it, like it was, it to me was almost uncomprehensible to think how much salmon that would take to feed these people. And yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of like you're saying you don't eat mm -hmm. salmon and, you know, where do we draw the line because nature doesn't even have enough to eat its own, mm -hmm. you know, food chain. Yeah. So yeah. How do we move forward? with Yeah, that? I think you've got to think about I mean, there's such a and something we really try to show again, and it comes stems from this idea of nature, you know, being come highly over commoditized. Mm -hmm. But um you know, we have in North America, most people don't live by the coast and salmon is perceived as this, you know, very mainstream meat to be eating. When in mm -hmm. reality, the salmon has been trucked from, from the coast. And we see this with so many foods. And I think um, you need to just in general, try to be aware of like where yeah. your, where your food is coming from. But um, yeah, it's unfortunate because, you know, these factory farms enable the mass production of salmon, which is highly unnatural, unnatural. Um, and we really don't want to be, um, you know, supporting that, right? Because we know how detrimental it is for wild salmon. So choose not to buy farm salmon. But at the same time, I really believe that if you live in, in North America, you're somewhere in the middle and you're eating salmon, even if it's wild, that, you know, you should question that. That should be a real treat or you should yeah. really perceive it as a real treat. Um, and uh, just because, you know, we can't be <laughs> consuming salmon on the levels that we are, we're just putting too much pressure on right. our environment. 
And well, I just, of course, that's why it was fish farms were created. Sorry, I kind of cut you off there. Um, but that's why fish farms were created because there was such a demand, we too much of a pressure on it. So right. yeah, I definitely agree with what you're saying. They, like, they perpetuate that demand. There's a big, yeah. you know, fish farms are behind a lot of the marketing that is salmon are an omega rich, yeah, like, yeah. you know, yeah. super food, healthy, right. you know, are what we eat. There's so many misconceptions around food. And, and, what and this eat. is why I want people to see your film because And just, I mean, these are, there's nothing happy about this situation. It's toxic. And that's what you're eating. Like people need to see it. So I know we only have a couple of more minutes. I just want to make sure people know uh, the film again, Coextinction. You can get tickets online at vif.org. Um, I believe it's screening from October 3rd to the 11th, including some high school screenings, which I was really happy to see because that means the younger folk are going to hear about all this. And that's so important. And a live show at the Hollywood in Vancouver, Friday, October 1st. I want to ask you, oh, and the action uh, line, which we will have as a link on our sites, but it's uh, www.coextinctionfilm.com slash action. And that's the link that, right? I that's what I've got. I it's take action. Oh, me... I've got slash. But I, might, I might be wrong. Nope, you're we'll right. We'll get it right. right. We'll put it you're on right. the you're site. You're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. And that's the place to go after you see this film and go, what can I do? Because we've got to keep this going. We can't just be looking at it and feeling, you know, the grief around it all. We've got to take action. We've got to step up. And so speaking of taking action, this may not be the best note to end on, but I can't sleep with um, this poor orca alone in Marineland. It's Niagara Falls. It's Canada. It's in captivity and has been for, I don't know, 40 years, but alone for 11. And it's, I think most people have seen the footage on social media of this um, whale banging her head against the tank and the idea being that she's trying to kill herself. What's your take on it? And most importantly, what can be done? Because they're, they're talking about um, moving her to a sanctuary, but there is no sanctuary. There's one being built in Nova Scotia, but it's nowhere near completion. So in the meantime, this poor whale is banging her. I mean, it couldn't be any clearer. I'm in pain. I hand it over. I, what um, can we do? I'll start by saying that it's really heartbreaking and uh, also that Kiska is not the only one. Um, right. Just because we're talking about the Southern resident orcas, um, Tokitai, which was renamed also, but um, she she's a Southern resident orca who is alone in um, in Miami Seaquarium. Um, and her mother is still alive. And um, I believe there's also Corky from the Northern resident orca population. I don't think she's alone though, but still there's so many orcas in captivity and um, and Kiska's video that went around the world, I think was important to bring that back up to the surface. And I think the first thing people can do is don't buy a ticket. Um, for all the campaigns, that's been such a huge thing. Don't buy a ticket. If you know someone who buys a ticket, talk to them you know, again, not like, not fear based and not attacking them, but have a conversation with them, try and show them that other perspective. And, um, and then, you know, I believe you told us you were doing that Tasha, but like, you know, contact the aquarium, use your voice in that way. That's always also a very great way. I, I don't know what the solution is without a sanctuary yet, but um, still speaking up on that and not show not buying a ticket and all of these things will definitely help. And yeah. contributing, I know the sanctuary is open to donations right now. They have a website. So if you just did, um, way, I think it's for whales and dolphins, um, and that's in Nova Scotia, and it's going to be quite beautiful. I mean, yes, they're not in the wild, but um, Kiska can't go in the wild. It has no teeth from chewing concrete, you know, in this unhappy situation. So sanctuaries are important, I think, too. And we can contribute that way and, and be involved also. Elena, did you have something you wanted to add there? Yeah, no, I just was going to say exactly what you said. I think um, if we can have these sanctuaries set up, that's, a, that's you know, one major barrier removed. Right. It's, it's definitely very challenging to get um, an orca out of a situation like that. We've seen that this kind of fight ongoing for years, but it's just, it's, it's just devastating, you know, to see that kind of behavior. Um, 
it's absolutely heart wrenching and it's also not surprising. We've seen this going on now for decades and it's just past the point of it being okay. And so I think, um, yeah, I'm glad that you brought it up because it's definitely an issue that really needs to be continued to be pushed on and addressed. And social media, post on social media, keep the conversation going. I mean, with all these things, um, we've got to keep talking. We can't be silent. Silence is consent and we just can't, right? Anymore. Can't, or we should never have, but we did. So now we can't. Um, I so appreciate you two being on the show. I'm really excited about the impact that your film is going to make because I think it will inspire a lot of people to stand up and do something. Um, and so I really thank you for making it and bringing it to the Vancouver Film Festival. Um, any final words before we kind of wrap for today? Anything we miss that's really important that you want our listeners to know? I no, thank you so much for having us. And um, I'm so glad we got to talk about, you know, the issues at some greater depth and definitely check out the Take Action page. I think for viewing the film, for seeing the film um, right now, we're in festivals. And so, you know, in that way, it's, it's a little bit tricky for the general public to access, but um, we will be on a platform online, hopefully very soon. So um, just stay tuned. If you follow us online, we're on social media and whatnot, you'll, um, you can stay in tune with when we're going to be releasing it to the public. Thank you. Anything from you, Gloria? Oh, I'll set it all. Just, uh, I'm okay. super excited to get the film out there. Thank you for everyone listening. Um, I changed my mind. Just don't buy salmon if you don't know. Yeah, just don't buy salmon if you don't know where it comes from. <laughs> okay. Well, we, we, just wait till my next, I'm not going to buy any, but I am going to talk to the fish department in my local Good. store. <laughs> all right. Thank you guys for being here. <laughs>